be your main host for this program. Uh, this special program is offered for all with questions and or comments regarding our spiritual journey uh, towards God. Our topics can include struggles with faith, questions about God, spiritual progress, and anything else related to our uh, journey to become like Christ. And before we do that, we want to open up in prayer and we will recite a prayer by St. Thomas Aquinas together. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Grant, Grant me, O Lord, Lord my God, God a, mind a mind to know you, a heart to seek you, wisdom to find you, conduct, conduct pleasing to you, faithful perseverance in waiting for you, and a hope of finally embracing you. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Father, Spirit. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I have with me my husband, Dr. Thomas Carr. He's also a co-host and a presenter where he will lead discussion about spiritual life and can answer any of your questions. So feel free to call the number on the screen or maybe text through social media with questions about anything that you want to know about faith, the journey towards God, about prayer, um, and that can be directed towards him, and he uh, who has a PhD in philosophy and theology. And before that, let me introduce myself because this is a new show. Uh, my name is Ina. Like I said before, I'm a mother of two. I homeschool my children. Well, one is already in college, but we, we live in Ave Maria, Florida. We just moved here. And we both are lay Dominican. Uh, I converted to the Catholic Church almost five years ago this fall from a Protestant background. And my passion is to see uh, people set free to embrace and experience fully their identity as the beloved children of God. And I also have keen interest in area of spiritual life and progress, especially in the area of prayer. So I may chime in once in a while, if that's okay You're with you. You're absolutely welcome to. You have some amazing <laughs> insights. And this is my husband, Dr. Thomas Carr, and he has received his Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. And he also has a Master and Doctorate in Philosophy and Theology from the University of Oxford. And he is also a convert to Catholicism and has served uh, as a professor of philosophy and religious study for 17 years. His passion, passions are defending the truth, combating falsehood, understanding the true nature of worship, along with study of apologetics, history, and the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas. Okay. So while we wait for calls and questions to come in, uh, maybe we can start with a few questions uh, about spiritual life, mm -hmm. right? Sure. But before that, maybe we can get <coughs> to know you better, our presenter. So, would you like to tell the audience more about yourself? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so, I'm a convert as well, like my wife, Ina. I was raised in a Presbyterian home. My father is a pastor, so I was very active in the church growing up. I went off to Princeton Theological Seminary to study for the, for the priesthood or the pastorate in the Presbyterian church, and I made the mistake of taking too many church father courses because I learned that the church fathers, especially the early ones all the way through St. Augustine, uh, really sounded very Catholic when I was trying to become a Presbyterian pastor, so that didn't sit very well with me. And I got to my senior year there at Princeton and I sought out a Catholic priest for um, some spiritual guidance. I was really not interested at the, in the Catholic Church at that point, but just needed to kind of clear the air. And uh, I started meeting with a fellow named Father John McCloskey. He is an Opus Dei priest, and at that time he was the chaplain at Princeton University. He got into a little bit of trouble, I'm afraid, with the Jesuits there because he was very conservative and they weren't. So they actually got him kicked off campus. But before that happened, uh, he and I met weekly. He had me read through the catechism and through some of the Vatican II documents and some of the historical teachings and writings about the church. And I fell in love with the Catholic Church. We worked through some of the issues, of course, coming from the Presbyterian Church. I needed to really make sure I was firmly grounded in scripture on issues like the papacy and the veneration of Mary. 
but he really helped me with those. And on the last day of my studies at Princeton, I was confirmed as a Catholic. Um, I went off to Oxford University where I studied for six years. I earned a master's degree and a doctorate in theology and philosophy. And I'm sad to say that after a couple of really hard knocks in life, I lost my faith. Um, I guess I maybe wasn't catechized quite well enough or maybe I wasn't quite ready for the church, but for, for whatever reason it didn't take. And uh, so I started teaching after I graduated and uh, was a professor of religious studies and philosophy for 17 years. But in the first early years of those, I met my wife, Ina, who had a very strong uh, faith. And she was an evangelical, charismatic Protestant at that time. And over the years, I think her praying for me and her care for me, her concern, uh, shortly after our marriage, and we started going to church uh, for a while. And then we both became very committed um, um, charismatic uh, Protestants. So I've refound my faith, but there was still a lot missing, and I was sort of pining away for the uh, Catholic faith. And uh, we were on a vacation when we were living at this time down in Florida, and I was flipping the, the <coughs> channels around, and I came across uh, EWTN, and I was listening to a beautiful sermon. It was by B uh, Bishop Barron at the time on the seven last words of Christ. He was quoting from St. Augustine and all of my favorite church fathers and Thomas Aquinas, and I knew I had to come back as a Catholic. To make a long story short, my wife, who at that time was very anti-Catholic, I started feeding her some material that I knew she would like, St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, yes. uh, and some other mystical saints, and she just fell in love with her writings, and she didn't understand why they were Catholic, but she knew that this was the real thing. I also started praying the rosary. I prayed the rosary every day for her for three months. And with that, the, at the end of that three-month period, she wanted to become a Catholic as well. So we were both, uh, she, she was received back into the church having been baptized as an infant. I was uh, received back into the church having fallen away from the church for a number of years. And, and here we are. We live in Ave Maria, and we're very happy to be hosting the show and sharing whatever we can with folks who are also on the journey towards God. That's very much where we are. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, that's a story of our conversion. And, and so my second question, if you have a question, you can call in the number on the screen, anything pertaining spiritual life, uh, Catholic life. Um, another question I have while we're waiting, uh, so what is, what is the goal of the spiritual life? Maybe you can explain that. That's a big question. <laughs> you're, you're, There's you're a very big answer to, to that. Actually, it's a very uh, simple answer. The goal of the spiritual life, the goal of our lives as Catholic Christians is to become one with Christ as we enter into heaven where in we will be one with God. So we learn to become one with Christ here in this life through uh, prayer and through the sacraments and through uh, various disciplines and bodily penances and so on. And as we let go more and more of this world and as we let go more and more of our own egos and selfishness and we had allow Christ to come in and reshape our hearts and reframe our thinking, we become more and more progressively like, like him. And of course, we need to be like him. We need to be in him when we enter into heaven and stand before God the Father on the day of judgment and render an account for our lives. So the spiritual life is all important. It is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And the one thing, the one thing that it aims at is that union with God through Christ, in Christ. Do you have anything to add to that? Because I know you have a lot of <laughs> insights on, on the, 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 uh, what the spiritual life is about. And um, yeah, I guess uh, the spiritual life is about us being transformed to one day become one mm. with Him and our God is pure. Okay, there's a call in. Hello, this is Maria Vision. Who is calling? Hi, this is Jessica. Jessica? Hi, Jessica. Do you have a question for Hi. us? Yeah, I had a question. Um, so basically, like, I've been trying to 
um, like find a spiritual director and I just wanted to know like based on your guys' advice as to like how can I like know who like the, like the correct spiritual director there is for me like how can I know if God wants a specific person for me to speak with do you have some answer hold on yes well I I'm going to defer to you because I know you have a beautiful answer to this. (laughs) Well, actually, yes, uh, I have an answer because I have the experience. And um, when, um, well, my first spiritual director was the parish priest. And and I know parish priests are very busy, but I guess he didn't have a choice then because I was (laughs) a new convert. I have too many questions. But also, one of the things, I did call the the diocese and uh, I think the formation director, you can call, and then they... Uh, what he basically told me is uh, one thing that you have to do number one is pray which I agree okay so you pray and then let's say you have um, you go to a parish and you if it's your own parish or so one of the priests in your parish you go to their mass how they celebrate mass Mm, very important you know how you know how do they preach their homily if if that's something that you agree with you think something that you can um, uh, benefit from then go to the next step, he said, go to the confession with him. If you go to confession with him and you, you feel like he's speaking into your life, then then pray again, <laughs> and then you might approach him. But I, it, it is not easy because uh, priests are, well, a lot of them are overworked, but I would say persistent. I know with my second spiritual director, he's the fifth person I ask, so I, I just never give up, and God oh, will... Wow. Yeah, God will give you the right one, but mm-hmm. it, it, it is not easy. And there is actually an app that's new that can help you, and maybe I can ask the staff here to send it to you. I have, I have your phone number, so I will do that after the program. But yeah, number one, pray first. That's important, and God will guide you. Awesome. I would just yeah. add to that, and that, that's exactly what I wanted my wife to say, that look, look, look at how they celebrate Mass and listen carefully how they uh, give you absolution in confession. Do they take that sacrament very seriously? Um, I would just add that make sure that you're on the same page theologically and spiritually because Catholic priests are, uh, you know, they're all across the spectrum in terms of where they're at theologically and spiritually. So you want to find someone who's very compatible with where you're at or where you would like to be, right? Someone who's sort of further along than you are in those areas. but yeah, that's really uh, the way they celebrate Mass. Do they take it reverently and, and seriously, as my wife said? And again, how do they um, do the sacrament of confession? Those two things. Yeah, I think that that's the main thing. And again, pray. <laughs> yeah. So you oh, and if, if the priest turns you down, be sure to ask that priest if they have someone else in mind that they might think is a good fit. Because many often priests will say, well, I don't do a spiritual direction myself, but I know a guy who does spiritual direction all the time. Actually, yeah. No, actually, that's a very good idea. Yeah. I did actually ask, um, this is back in D.C., I asked a lady who's, who's, she's actually the leader of our chapter, a Dominican chapter, and she referred me to one priest, and this priest cannot because he needs to go somewhere else, and he referred me to five other priests. So I asked mm-hmm. all the one down the list. So, yeah, that's actually a good referral. Referrals, Because they, yeah. they, they would know which priests actually are good directors. I think not all of them are. Right, Some right. of them don't even want to. So that, that's actually good, yeah, good advice. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you for the advice. Yeah. I really appreciate you guys. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. No problem. Bless Our you. pleasure. Yeah, I will, I will send you the email of that app after this, uh, the link of that app. Awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank yeah, you, Jessica. Welcome. Thanks for calling in. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye now. Okay. That was a good question. Yeah, it was very good. So now that uh, we talk about spiritual life, my next question is, I think everybody wants to know, I want to know from you, what is the best way we can attain this goal here on earth mm. in terms of union with God? Well, we both can answer that question, and we probably would approach that question from different perspectives. Um, I tend to be a little more cerebral, intellectual, so my um, my formation really takes place largely in my mind. Uh, I'm not saying that I, I'm imagining it, but the sources of my faith journey have really come through scripture primarily, number one by, by mm-hmm. far. 
um, good spiritual reading, good healthy spiritual reading, and uh, listening to some really good uh, talks that you will find on YouTube. There are all kinds of podcasts and YouTube channels that are really committed to giving us healthy formation, good, strong, Catholic, traditional, spiritual formation. And uh, listen to those. Like my wife, before she became a Catholic, one of the things you did was listen very... Uh, binge, binge listening. Binge, binge to listening. Bishop Barron. To Bishop Barron largely. <laughs> he's, he's, he's wonderful. I mean, we, we have a few difficulties with some of his teaching, but we wonderful for getting people into the Catholic Church yes. who might have some hesitation otherwise. And you, you were just hooked on those. I mean, reading, yeah. reading spiritual books, I just devour books after books, the saints right. or, you know. Right, right. So. Um, and of course, my, my wife will cover this side of it, but prayer and uh, frequenting, frequenting the sacraments, daily Eucharist as much as you can, big part of our becoming one with Christ, um, and going to confession as often as we can, at least monthly. Yeah. I think one thing I want to add, a big part of it, is uh, doing a lot of fasting and praying. Mm. Uh, I know yeah. a lot of times when I feel dry spiritually, feel like I'm far away from God, and I do some fasting, for example, and God just comes near. And I, I know it has a lot to do, what we give out, what we give up, has a lot to do with how much God comes in into your life. And, and he just, he just, um, it's just this exchange between us giving up what, you know, the very little that we have or nothing that we have, but he comes in and he just replaced that and yeah. replaced it with, with himself. Right. Yes. All right. Well, I think we're about at a little bit of a break time here. Yeah. Are we closing in prayer? I guess we're closing. parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear.
welcome back to Ask, Seek, and Knock. And I'm Ina, and this is Dr. Carr, and he has something to say about spiritual life. I, I just wanted to add one point um, that I think my wife would be able to pick up on as well, but uh, we're talking about the goal of the spiritual life being union with God and our preparation for that by becoming one with Christ as we walk toward that moment where we will stand before the Father. We will render an account for our lives and then he will assess his judgment on whether we enter in or whether we need a little more time or, or whatever. But our preparation for that, of course, is becoming one with Christ, living in Christ and him living within us and his will, taking our will, his mind, thinking his thoughts in our mind and mm -hmm. his heart feeling what he feels uh, instead of our own petty little uh, small emotional range, we get his emotional range. Um, that's, that's the goal and that is the spiritual life in the Catholic faith. I was at a men's group a few days ago and um, a question was thrown out to our table. Uh, what is the, the end of our Christian discipleship? What are we aiming at? What are we trying to become by being faithful and devotional in our daily lives, our day-to-day -day lives? And uh, one of the answers that was put out there was from a, a, an older man. And uh, he said, our, our goal in, as Christians is to be just like Christ. We're to um, sort of say the things that he said and we're to turn the other cheek and we're to show mercy to everybody. And, and and, and that was it. That was kind of where it stopped. And he's not wrong. That certainly is a big part. We are to imitate Christ and we are to walk with Christ and to learn the virtues that he displayed and take on his values and so on. Um, but it's really much more than that, isn't it? It's, it's really him becoming us and us becoming him and uh, forgetting more and more of who we are and becoming more and more of what he is, and um, that's a much more difficult path, a much more difficult path. You know, he did say, take up your cross, die every day, and come follow me. He didn't say, take up your ambitions, or take up your dreams, or take up the things, all the things your parents would hope you would turn into. Don't take up that. No, he's not saying that. He's saying, take up your cross cross, of course, is an instrument of death. And so um, the, the simple answer of just being like Christ is, it's, it's not wrong, but it, it's not enough. Well, uh, you, you go ahead, you, you chip in too. It's enough, but the requirement is everything. Uh, uh, it is enough, that's the truth, but the requirement yeah. is your life. It's mm. everything that you have, everything that you are, because to follow Christ is to follow him to the cross. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about love, what this gentleman was saying, just love, love, love. What is love? Love is not feeling. Mm. You know, when, when I become a mom, um, I'm not really a kid person, but <laughs> <laughs> when I become a mom, uh, how many years ago? 18 years ago, it was a shock in my life because I have to... I didn't realize how selfish I was. Mm. I didn't realize what love is, which is, you know, waking up every three hours, uh, feeding the baby, and uh, you know when the kids are sick. And it, it is not being parent is all about self-giving. It's very difficult. It was very difficult to me. It's still very difficult now yeah. as being a parent. It's not easy. And following Christ is even more than that. Mm. I mean. This is, this is the shock that I have being a uh, convert to the Catholic faith. Being a charismatic Protestant, it was easier. It's all about freedom from suffering. Mm -hmm. that, that's actually what we, we learn. So we pray for healing and freedom. There's nothing wrong with praying for healing, but this is freedom from suffering. You don't need to suffer anymore because Christ has already taken it on the cross and that's it. Now you just become happy and prosperous. What I learned from reading the saint just shocked me because these saints, the way they love God, they give everything. Mm. They give everything. They do penance. They take reparation. They, 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 they don't only feed the poor. I mean, they, you know, Saint Catherine Siena, for example, she she was um, uh, 
what is it, uh, helping this, this lady with, with the pus on her skin, and she would drink the water that has pus in it. I mean, and, and, and they will give up their life. A lot of martyrs in the Catholic faith but that we don't really hear in the Protestant, right? Right. So following Christ, it is true that, yeah, we just follow Christ, but it's not just follow Christ. You literally have to die every hour, every yeah. day, yeah. you know, uh, dying to your desire, dying to your ambition, dying to your dream. Oh, there's another call. Hold on, there's another call coming. Hello, Maria Vision. Purgatory um, as converts, was it hard to pray for those in purgatory? Uh, and have you question. read um, the books on St. Catherine of Siena? Because she speaks a lot about purgatory. I wanted to maybe get your view or your thoughts on her perspective as a doctor of the church. This is your. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to take that. And that's a very good question. Um, for, I'm, I'm going to put the phone down no, here. No, on your mic. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll hang up and listen live. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for calling in. Uh huh. Yeah. For for some reason, purgatory was not a doctrine I struggled with. Yes. Like most converts, I struggled more with the the, the teachings around Mary and you know, the assumption of her body into heaven, her immaculate conception, her coronation in heaven. These were. I, I didn't have any grounding in any experience uh, with that in my Presbyterian upbringing. But there is kind of a, um, in, in the Reformed tradition that I came from, there is a sort of a heavy feeling of guilt that we carry around because uh, we are understood to be totally depraved in the Calvinist tradition. There is nothing good in us at all. And so then the thought of standing in front of God at the judgment day mm. uh, when there's nothing good in me at all and my only uh, my only recourse is to plea the blood of Christ that's that was the phrasing right for how you should be saved in the Calvinist tradition but for me that didn't seem very just or fair that uh, I would have committed a number of sins and never fully paid for them in this life. And so then I just get a free ticket into heaven. I don't know. I guess because of that Calvinist background, I was able to accept the doctrine of purgatory quite easily. It was not a big, not a big struggle for me. Um, it certainly seemed to me to be an, an expression of the justice of God, mm -hmm. that God would create a, a, a realm wherein those who might have received his grace at the very last minute on their deathbed could still justly and fairly atone for their sins and then enter into heaven as truly new creatures. That to me seemed like a beautiful expression of God's justice. It also um, seems very fair and just to those of us that might have committed sins long ago that we never really fully confessed or maybe sins that we only partially confessed you know, there's a lot of, a lot of ambiguity and gray area in our confessional practice, and I'm, I'm, it pleases me to know that there is a way for me to make things right, even if I didn't make them right here on, on Earth. Mm. Um, so the doctrine of purgatory. In addition, I knew that there are scriptural references that implicate the idea of purgatory. There are some Old Testament expressions of contrition for sins that have already been committed uh, that support the doctrine of purgatory. And then, we, of course, we have revelations from the writings of the saints. And you mentioned St. Catherine of Siena. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, sweetie. I, I think purgatory, uh, I didn't even think about it when I just converted because mm -hmm. it didn't even enter my mind. It was the last thing I worry about when I converted. It's not, yeah, it, Mary was my big stumbling block and right. the saint, the communion of saints. And... Um, but I think after a, a year or the second year of conversion, I just realized that, hey, I can go to hell. Mm. My daughter can go to hell, but she said the prayer. I said the prayer because as a Protestant, once you said the Jesus prayer, the, what's it called? The, the receiving Jesus into your life prayer, 
you're guaranteed you're going to heaven. Right. Once saved, always saved. Yes. Yeah. So I actually had this discussion with my spiritual director because I was like in a grip of fear. I was afraid. So I think after a while, the idea of purgatory actually becomes like mercy to mm -hmm. me. It's like, okay, I still have a chance. If yeah. I can't make it now, I can still go there. So for me, but I never had any issue with that because it wasn't an issue in the beginning of conversion. But um, yeah, the thought of going to hell was really scaring me mm -hmm. uh, as a Catholic. I'm like, you mean I lost my salvation? But now I know that there is purgatory. There is a second chance even yeah. after we die. Right. right. And I think, too, God in his mercy allows some of us, at least, to go through a kind of purgatory here on earth, even if it's not something we chose. Like, a long-term cancer illness can be a kind of purgatory, I think. If it's embraced um, lovingly as coming from, not necessarily that God gave you cancer, but that God has allowed someone who might have otherwise spent a long time in purgatory to erase some of that guilt and earn some merit by surrendering to the will of God in that kind of thing. And so uh, that gives us some hope. Now, it's not that we don't show mercy and compassion to those that are suffering from cancer. You know, you don't tell them you're get doing this because you deserve it, your, uh, your sins. But it does indicate that when there is suffering that is involuntary, not a product of our own sins, but is embraced as coming from the hand of God, or at least allowed by God's hand, then, then I think can be also a kind of purgatory. Yeah. Okay. I guess the last question we have. Um, and terms, I think we're down to about a minute here. We yeah. I don't much know. Time. In terms of spiritual life, I guess, um, what are the things that you think is... We can keep going. Yeah. We can keep going. Uh, that impacts you the most as a Catholic, as opposed as a Protestant mm. in the Catholic Church, the rich tradition that we have. Oh my gosh, you're going to... I know. <laughs> you're going to give me too many. But there really is one that stands out above the rest, and I, I think we may be on the same page with this too, but... The, the one thing that the Catholic Church has, and we could also say that the Orthodox uh, Christians have this as well, but mm -hmm. you certainly don't find it in any of the, of the uh, non-Catholic Christian communities, and that is the Eucharist. The real presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, who has humbled himself. We can't even imagine how much he's humbled himself to be with us in that particular mm -hmm. form. And here is something that is unique about the Catholic faith, and that is that we venerate and adore the Eucharistic presence of Christ. We are privileged here in Ave Maria to have a 24-7 adoration chapel. We both take advantage of that, and there's, there's nothing quite like sitting in the presence of Jesus spiritually for a period of time, if you can afford that time, because it does change. It does change who you are and how you think and what you value. And taking him into your body. Right. right? Absolutely. Becoming his blood becoming your blood. Yeah. 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 When when I converted to the Catholic Church, it's like I job uh, my I drop my jaw and, and I haven't been able to pick it up because yeah. like this is the Catholic Church. How come I don't know about this as a Protestant for twenty five years? I didn't know anything about the Eucharist that Jesus is actually here. It's his present. I can see, I can touch, I can consume him yeah. and and that that was a shock I'm still shocked even until now mm -hmm. that we're actually Catholic that we're actually <laughs> in Ave Maria I, Florida I can't believe I can't believe my wife whom I married and she was anti-Catholic and thought the Catholic Church was possessed by demons is sitting here with me on a Catholic show talking about the Eucharist <laughs> unbelievable unbelievable well God is good God is very gracious and uh, we certainly appreciate those of you who are watching and those who have called in Hello, Maria Vision. Oops. Uh, my name is Sophia. Yes. Yes, Sophia. Uh, Hi, Sophia. <laughs> I wanted to ask, um, I heard you are part of it, the lay order of the Dominicans, mm. right? Yes. Uh -huh. So if you could just share about that. Um, I mean, I know a little bit I was saying, I know she was kind of like that, right? She was like a member of the Dominicans, but not a nun. Yes. So if you yeah. can share about that, when it started, what? your spirituality okay. is. Yeah, we can. We can do that. Okay. Yeah, I think, and we both have sort of different journeys into the Dominican order. 
we are lay Dominicans. We're not fully professed just yet. So we're still kind of on the journey, but we're three years in, two more years to go. And we uh, host and lead a lay Dominican group here in town, Ave Maria. And if anybody's interested, we have brochures and pamphlets in the back of the, of the main parish church here that gives you more detail. Uh, my introduction to the, to the Dominican order in general and to the Dominican saints in particular came very early because I was actually named after Thomas Aquinas. My father was a theologian and pastor. Thomas Aquinas Protestant was his pastor. Po Protestant pastor. His okay. favorite theologian was Thomas Aquinas. He named me after himself. His name is also Thomas, but he wanted to give me his, my, as a middle name, Aquinas. Um, <laughs> In any case, Thomas Aquinas stuck with me through all those years, and one of the things I so appreciate about his writings and about many of the Dominican writings today is that they're very, very clear. They're very um, well-structured, well-ordered, uh, and it makes the faith it seem, and, and because it is, <laughs> extremely logical and coherent. To me, that's, that's important because, as I said, my, my journey tends to be more cognitive than emotional. Um, so I was attracted to the Dominicans. I love their history. I love the, the stories around St. Dominic are just amazing, amazing saint. And some of the lay, uh, I'm sorry, some of the um, contemporary Dominicans that are active today at the Angelicum, there were a number of here, number of them here in town for a Thomas Aquinas conference. They're just beautiful souls. They really are. Um, there's something about the, the, the motto of the order is to contemplate the truths of God, and then share the contemplation, either in the form of teaching or preaching or writing. And I love that. I'm, I'm all over that. And I think your journey into the Dominican order is, is different, isn't it? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're a very different personality. Yeah. Um, yeah, mine is more because of prayer. Uh, because mm. of Saint Dominic, Saint Dominic is a is a saint of prayer. He did he did a lot of penance, a lot of uh, he he used to um, you know pray all night. He wouldn't sleep. He would sleep on the floor. He weeps a lot. Mm. He cries a lot. He would he would sleep with his brothers, and the brothers would be awake because he's just crying all night. And so it's not because of the crying I'm interested, but it's just his heart for evangelism. I guess um, I'm always drawn to evangelism because I was um, saved, my uh, converted very dramatically by God when I was 25, and so soul has been always my my passion. Mm. And so when we converted to become a Catholic, you know, the first year, even the first year already, all, of course, John of the Cross kind of converted me. So I, I was thinking maybe I should be a Carmelite, but. Um, but the Dominican order really attracted me because of their charism, which is really saving souls. That's really what they, the, what, what they do. Mm -hmm. And so from even the first year, we were really attracted to that. And then we moved to Washington, D.C. just to be close to the Dominican House of Study so we can be part of the chapter. But yeah, St. Dominic, St. Catherine, Siena, more on the prayer side than the cognitive side, uh, not really because of Thomas Aquinas, I become a Dominican, but more because of the, the saints. And, and they have so many saints and blessed that are just off the chart, mm. if you read about them, yeah. in terms of their prayer life. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's a beautiful order, and it has an amazing history. You know, we're living in an age right now where the church is in major crisis. I don't think there's any getting around that. And yeah. where, where, wherever you are at theologically, uh, we all have to admit that the church is in a decline, a very serious decline. The Dominicans, if you look at their founding in the early part of the 13th century on down through the day to today, uh, are usually at the forefront of revival and renewal in church periods that were very much like ours. You know, the, the lax uh, discipline and uh, a sloppy way of doing mass and uh, you know, the, the, theologians who are not teaching what the church teaches, and yeah, uh, you find vision. Dominicans turning things around in yeah. a lot of ages. Hello? Yeah. Hello, is a phone call coming? Yes? Yeah, I'd like to know. Yes, yes. What Sorry, what's your name? Michael Zerby. Okay. Michael. Hi, Michael. Michael. What can I do? I'd like to know what happens if a baby is aborted. 
if we go to heaven or not? That's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, and I, I don't have a definitive answer for you on that because I don't think the church, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I could be wrong because I know the church has done a lot of thinking about this recently. Um, there is a tradition in ancient Catholicism of a sort of in-between place called limbo where infants who died before they could be baptized went. Uh -huh. And it was, you know, it was not hell, it was not dark, it was not uh, a dangerous place, it was a pleasant place, but it wasn't heaven either. And I know that in recent years, uh, the church has kind of given a rethink about that particular doctrine. And my understanding, and again, I, I'm not really up to speed on the latest of this, but my understanding is that the church is much more open now to uh, at allowing infants, because of the immense suffering that they went through, that they experienced a kind of baptism of desire. And it's not that they de necessarily desired to be with God in heaven, because of course an infant wouldn't have that cognitive ability. But the angels and the saints and those aware of that baby's death would be praying for that person and there would be a kind of transference of merit onto their soul so that okay, they are you. rescued they are uh, with the believers in heaven um, but i don't think the church has made a definitive statement on that it's more of a kind of an act of faith at this point and it certainly is a beautiful faith mm -hmm. to have um, now of course that should not prohibit us from putting an end to the evil of abortion Right. We don't want those little babies to be in that position where they're not able to embrace the love of God for themselves because they weren't given a life. Um, we want all children to be raised and being loved and, and to find God on their own. But in this case, which is such a horrendous thing with millions of babies suffering that fate every year, it, it's a beautiful thought to think that there are also millions of new souls up in heaven who are maybe even praying for the mothers that had that abortion. That's a powerful thought. But it's a great question. I'm sorry I don't have a definitive answer to you, but that I've told you about as much as I know. Thank you for calling in, Michael. Thanks. Well, thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Any more? Can I talk about the Dominican continue? If you want, yeah, sure. Are you? You're in the middle of a I sentence. That they're in the edge oh, of yes, um, that, uh, renewal. Yeah, there, I read a, a recent book, um, and I, it's by Robert Mattei. He's an Italian philosopher of culture, and he, he wrote a, a sweeping history throughout the centuries, highlighting every time the church got into a major uh, crisis, and how did they get out of it? Now, in, in many centuries, well, I shouldn't say many, in some periods of time, it was the lady who rose up. Mm -hmm. And there's an interesting um, cultural thing going on around the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries where more and more lady are moving off of the farms where they had been, you know, indentured servants and into the cities, finding better jobs, making more money, having more leisure time. In that leisure time, they learn how to read and the only book available to them at that time would be the Bible. So they start to read the Bible, lay people, and they realize that, wait a minute, there are all these scriptures in here that speak about holiness and giving up sin and turning away from darkness, and yet I see my priest not doing any of that, right? <laughs> and so there was this period, around the time when the Dominicans were founded, in fact, of uh, lay people who were calling bishops and priests to account and uh, in fact, a number of those lay people became Dominicans themselves. They're, they became sort of the foundation of the lay Dominican order, as well as some of the uh, brothers and friars. Uh, but it's just an interesting um, study to see how, it, it, after the order was founded in 1225 or so, the, uh, the Dominicans were always very active right there at the center whenever the church got into a crisis situation. You know, it's not a 
cloistered order. So it's, they're not the Carthusians where they're praying 16 hours a day in their cell. They're an active order. They live in and around university cities. They're very influential in the culture. And of course, they had to have a voice. So it's, um, yeah, it's not surprising, I should say, that the Dominicans were responsible for so many great reform movements. But I guess the question I have today is, where are the Dominicans and where are they standing up for now? And there are some, of course, that are doing that. But Just waiting, waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be their cheerleader from the side. <laughs> OK. I think it's on. Yeah, I don't. Um. So we just thank you all for coming yeah. to be with us. Um, it looks like we'll be here each week. We invite you to come in uh, and uh, share your thoughts and your questions with us. Uh, we're also hoping to have on board with us a uh, Dominican friar or two Maybe. from time to time. We're not sure about or, that. Or a priest. Or a priest, a local priest here. We have some fr several priest friends. And uh, we'd be happy to help you on your spiritual journey toward God in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you all. We want to close, however, with another prayer by Thomas Aquinas. And if you have some more uh, questions, you can post it on uh, social media, and so we can answer it next week. And yes. we will close with prayer from St. Thomas Aquinas. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grant me grace, O merciful, merciful God, God, to, to desire ardently, ardently all, all that is pleasing to you, to you to examine it prudently, to acknowledge it truthfully, and to accomplish it perfectly for the praise and glory of your name. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. God bless you all. We'll see you again next week. children. Today, I am carrying my son Jesus to you. For him to give you his peace. Little children, without peace, you do not have a future or blessing. Therefore, Return to prayer because the fruit of prayer is joy and faith, without which you cannot live. Today's blessing which we give you, carry to your families and enrich all those whom you met, that they may feel the grace which you are receiving. Thank you for having responded to my call. Dear children, 
you are and you are called children of God if only your hearts will feel that immeasurable love which God has for you your hearts will adore and give thanks to him at every instant of your life therefore little children today on this day of grace open your hearts and implore the Lord for the gift of faith children of God. 